name is Aaron Williamson. I'm the head of the Open Source Writing Initiative at Finos. Um, we run these meetings every two weeks on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, there's a calendar invite, uh, and if you uh, aren't receiving it now, you're welcome to email Aaron at Finos.org if you'd like to be added. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Toby Langell. Uh, Toby is an open source consultant with uh, a consultancy called Unlock Open. Uh, he works with uh, uh, with clients in a number of industries, including financial services, to uh, help them put together their open source compliance programs and understand how to better engage with uh, developers in the community. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about um, open source contribution policies that don't suck. In other words, that are uh, that are developer friendly. I think, uh, Toby. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's that's a one way of looking at it. Um, I do think there are other, I mean, well, you'll see throughout the presentation, but I think the whole point is to get a, um, you know, towards policies that are friendly to everyone, not only developers, and that you can um, do, you can have policies that benefit everyone, basically, in the company. Great. Well, um, without further ado, I'll let you take it away and begin your presentation. Thanks for joining Wonderful. us. Thank you so much. I hope, um, hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing uh, fine despite uh, unusual circumstances. Um, just a quick note before I get started, this talk was originally uh, given to a more sort of like uh, tech uh, vertical. So I'm aware that there are um, you know, policy and, and, and law differences um, between sort of where uh, the financial vertical, financial service vertical sits in. Um, and so feel free to sort of like call me out when you, you bump into, uh, when we bump into areas where you know, uh, you know, the, the situation is a bit different. Because uh, I think that would be uh, very enriching, uh, you know, for everyone to actually have a conversation about this, either during the, the presentation itself or at the end of it. Um, so uh, let's get started. So, you know, one of the um, first question that pops up um, when you talk about um, open source uh, policies is whether you have one as a company or not. Um, so what I usually do when I give this talk to a room of people, I actually ask people to raise their hands. This is gonna be a bit difficult here, so we'll just uh, move ahead with the data points that I have. Um, and so uh, what's interesting is, uh, you know, there's a survey that, that ran in, in 2018 on this topic and that asked um, people uh, uh, tied to the Linux Foundation 2 the group, like the developers tied to the Linux Foundation 2 the group, um, about whether they had open source policies in their company or not. And so, you know, if you look at the data points, it's kind of um, concerning because it turns out that close to half um, don't have one. Um, about 40% only do, and then 13% of respondents actually don't have any clue as to whether they do have an open source policy or not. Um, if you're digging into that data a little more, you'll find out that the smaller the company, uh, the less um, policy, the, the less open source policies that you'll find there. Um, and obviously, the bigger uh, the company, the more clarity. You know, there is, right? Um, but you know, what's important to consider is uh, this was a survey ran by the Linux Foundation for the Tudor Group, which is a, a group that um, is a collection of um, uh, um, people that uh, are part of uh, open source um, um, uh, pro programs at companies. So, you know, a very savvy tech audience, right? And even in that kind of audience, you'll find you find that. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of lack of clarity into how this is organized, right? Um, and, you know, this begs the question, what does not having a policy actually mean? And, you know, the belief is, well, if we don't have a policy, um, it, we just don't have a policy. But in fact, you, you do have a policy. It, it's just like it's not written. It's implicit, right? It's not clear. And, uh, you know, I... I can quote uh, Heather Meeker here, uh, which says, like, you have a policy whether it is written down or not. 
right? It could range from no open source at all to anything goes, but like if it's not written, well, you know, you don't really have, it's not super, it's not super clear. Um, and, you know, on the other hand, having a policy by itself doesn't mean that you're really solving that problem properly, right? So for example, a policy could be extremely restrictive um, and prevent developers from actually um, participating in the open source projects that they need to, even from like their, what they're actually um, hired to work on. Um, it could also be extremely um, full of red tape, you know, and like uh, getting approval to participate could be very long and complex. Um, the processes to obtain approval could be completely opaque. Like, you know, it could be like a black box that you ask, can I join this project and have a yes or no and have absolutely no idea as to why it was approved or why it wasn't and, and you know, no indication of uh, what you could have done differently if you could work on a subset of the project and that would be approved or not, right? So basically you can have, you can not have a policy, a written down policy, um, and uh, you still have an, an implicit one, but you can also have an explicit written down policy that is actually not really fulfilling any of the goals that it should be. So if we sort of like um, put these two um, you know, concepts, restrictive and permissive on an axis and implicit and explicit on the other one, uh, we can start actually putting companies um, you know, or kind of companies um, on, on, in this graph and sort of figuring out where people are and how they are, uh, you know, um, how they're traveling, where they're going to, as they grow, was, there mature, was they mature? So if you look, for example, like small and medium enterprises are going usually to be in the implicit and rather permissive um, um, quadrant of um, this graph. If you look at startups, startups tend to be a lot more implicit about most things in general, and they tend to be less permissive about open source than slightly bigger companies because they're very much product focused. And so they don't really want their developers or their engineers to be focusing on anything but the actual products that they're building, which frankly, from a business perspective, makes complete sense. Um, Non-tech enterprise. So this is sort of, you know, roughly where um, the the um, well, the ba banking services probably fall sort of like in that category, although they're increasingly more in the uh, actual tech enterprise category, and so you find that in most of the sector, uh, it's rather restrictive, but it's also not super well spelled out, right? So it's kind of implicit. All the tech companies, which is probably where you'll find most financial services right now, too are in the restrictive category and they're quite explicit about it, right? If you think about, uh, you know, companies like, uh, you know, even Microsoft, like a, um, a, a over a decade ago, uh, saying that, you know, Linux was a cancer is kind of like super explicit about how they perceive open source in general. They perceive them, sorry. Um, so, you know, if, if you had a patent troll, right? Uh, and and the, mapped in that, in that graph, it would be, well, highly restrictive and highly explicit, right? Of course, because it would be uh, super protective of the IP it's trying to actually leverage. Um, tech companies uh, tend to be on the explicit and permissive side right now. Um, there's someone that's not muted. Place, uh, from a call-in user, if you could mute yourself. That please. would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so tech companies tend to be more permissive and, you know, more on the permissive and explicit side. Um, and of course you'll find trendsetters here, uh, that are super explicit, super permissive, uh, uh, you know, thinking, for example, of a company like GitHub, right? Um, so what's interesting is to look the kind of like, um, transition companies do as they grow or as they go through digital transformation. So let's have a look at what would happen to a startup that grows into more of a larger company, right? As the startup grows, um, it's going to, uh, you know, become more explicit about rules, right? 
And it's also going to become more permissive about its open source approach as new developers join the company that are less necessarily focused on you know, the original product, but maybe um, building infrastructure for the company, et cetera. Now, what's interesting is there's a point of inflection where that startup is gonna hire its first IP counsel, um, or maybe get acquired, acquired and maybe go through um, um, a funding round where the VCs will be more, um, um, you know, looking more finely at like the software and the, the licensing around it. And what usually tends to happen right at that inflection point is you have an IP council that comes in. And so, woo, suddenly as the company grows, um, everything becomes a lot more explicit, right? And everything becomes a lot more restrictive. Um, and that usually can be like a, a real problem for the company if it needs to have an effective open source program. So what you'd like to see instead of that is the company becoming more, ex more explicit, obviously, but keeping the same level of permissiveness or even increasing it. Uh, now, if you look at an old tech company, um, you know, like for example, Microsoft, um, uh, when it was sort of like very restrictive, uh, the tendency is for those to become uh, more permissive as they sort of understand and figure out the value of having a strong open source culture. Finally, um, if you look at the non-tech uh, enterprise sector, uh, the tendency there is to be just more explicit about this. Whereas what you'd like to see instead, right, is them to be both more explicit, but also become more permissive because of the value that they can get out of being more involved in the open source culture and the um, you know building open source projects and all of the, the benefits that you get from participating in basically where innovation happens in tech. Right. So you know all of that to say that the area that you really want to go towards is one that's both explicit and uh, as permissive as you can. Uh, make it. Um, so let's now sort of dive into, um, you know, what makes a policy that doesn't suck. And for that, we'll look at the perspective of the different stakeholders of an open source contribution policy, right? So from an engineering perspective, um, what you see is that a good policy is one that is permissive, right? So, you know, it allows, uh, open source contribution to be part of uh, the organization's engineering culture and best practices, right? Um, and it's based on trust and autonomy. Engineers know what um, open source projects they should be involved with um, to help with the products that they're building. Secondly, um, uh, such a, a policy is explicit. Uh, the decision-making process is well-documented and transparent. Right. You want to know um, when your, you know, your IP council rejects um, uh, an engineering uh, organization, part of engineering org, to participate on a on a specific project. You want to understand why, and you want to sort of be able to, uh, you know, eventually even escalate the conversation around, around this to um, weigh uh, the cost and benefit of being involved with that kind of with that particular. Project. Thirdly, you want the policy to be informative, right? Um, if you cannot use, um, you know, AGPL because you're building um, uh, a software as a service, well, instead of just saying, no, you cannot use the software, actually educating uh, the engineers on the reason for not being able to use AGPL uh, is going to clarify um, um, to them why, and they will not be asking all the time, and it will help them, you know, potentially find, uh, you know, have that as a criteria when they're looking for projects uh, that they can rely on to build the software that they're building. Right? And lastly, the critical aspect is that it has to be as frictionless as possible, right? Uh, the worst kind of policies are those where engineers uh, exchange emails was the legal department for a week before getting an approval or uh, uh, you know a, a rejection uh, over email, right? That doesn't make any sense. 
you want to be, you want to minimize uh, the kind of interactions. You want to make it as fast as possible and as clear as possible. Now, if you look that from the perspective of, you know, uh, the legal department inside of a company, uh, and, you know, here I just want to clarify that I'm not a lawyer. So if you have things that you want to add here, if you have a legal background, or if you have such a role in the company, or if this is different in the financial uh, industry, uh, you know, a great time to uh, sort of like raise your hand and, and talk about it. But basically, uh, in general, the role of the legal in the company is sort of like to minimize risk, right? And a few things that they will focus on is avoiding to, uh, you know, give away competitive advantage, um, protecting IP that can use that can be used defensively or, you know, sometimes even offensively. Um, this is very common, for example, around tech companies. Um, and also want to avoid so, sort of like things related to reputational damages and accidental infringement, right? And that includes, uh, you know, compliance. Um, another thing that a uh, legal will want is processes that are consistently followed across the company, right? The worst kind of situation from the legal department's perspective is when they have a set of policies and then they find out like a whole bunch of organizations are like, you know, um, not uh, following them or aren't aware of those policies or doing things completely differently um, or just contributing to open source uh, on their own time without asking. Uh, so, you know, there's plenty of like ways this can go wrong. And so one important aspect for, from, from a you know, legal department's perspective is consistently, for, you know, consistent consistency across the company. Um, the other aspect is from a legal perspective, um, legal wants to be savvy about what gets written down and what doesn't, right? Uh, uh, in the US, for example, you have uh, the triple damage clause um, around, um, 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 you know, when you, when you use a patent knowingly, right? Uh, so you wanna make sure, for example, that engineers, uh, are not looking at um, patents to find out um, whether they can use something or not, right? But so, you know, depending on, on the cases, you have uh, times when you want um, a paper trail and times where you really don't from a legal perspective, right? Um, and then the last thing, which I think is important and which I think a, a really strong open source contribution policy can help with is, uh, you don't want the legal department to be drowning in a sea of like menial issues and missing out on the key uh, licenses that they should have had a look at, right? Um, for example, if you're, you know, you're building again, um, uh, a software as a service uh, product um, and you have 150 open source projects that are used to build it, 149 of which are MIT, uh, everything's fine. You don't want to miss the one that is uh, a, a critical piece of the whole thing, which has an AGPL license, right? So, you know, that's the kind of thing that if you have a good policy and like clear systems, you, you'll uh, have a better chance of avoiding. Um, finally, from the business perspective, so more from like an executive level, um, what exactly are you looking for? Well, you're looking for engineering to be happy and productive, right? Because you want a, a you know a good innovative engineering. Could whoever's uh, uh, not muted and moving around possibly mute uh, themselves? Because I think it's it's really going to be difficult for people to follow along. Was Would be Chris Barrent, who's uh, who has the audio doing things. Can the host actually mute everybody and then unmute Toby? Unfortunately, there is a there was a mix up with the host function, so no. Uh, but I think we're okay now. Good. Thank you, folks. Um, so yeah, so you know, from an executive perspective, from the business perspective, what you want is engineering to be happy and productive, right? You also want risks to be minimized and well understood. You want a strong and, and you know good communication between legal and engineering so everyone's happy 
and everyone's able to talk to one another and uh, you know um, find solutions to common problems. Um, and obviously, you want an, an alignment between the decisions that are made and your business goals, right? So, if a, a project, um, you know, if it would be great from an, an engineering perspective to be able to contribute to a project, but uh, there was, uh, you know, litigation happening at the same time was um, a, a huge contributor to that project. Maybe now is not the right time to actually be investing in that project. And so you want, you know, good communication about this and alignment and trust on, on all sides. Um, and, you know, one of the things that makes uh, this conversation sort of difficult is that um, there is a very different way of seeing the world. Um, so I'm painting those broad strokes here, right? But like there is a, a, a different culture and a different way of seeing the world between legal and engineering in a, in a company, right? So for example, legal really wants to minimize risk. And on the other hand, engineering will want to maximize velocity, right? So they, engineering will want to go as quickly as they can and legal will want to go as slowly as possible to avoid accidents. Um, if you look at communication preference, um, uh, lawyers are often concerned about paper trails, and so they will prefer to actually have meetings where they speak to other people. And on the other hand, engineers, what they really want is asynchronous communication that is done in written, right? So again, conflict. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concepts of manager's schedule versus maker's schedule, but basically um, engineering requires long blocks of um, a time to work on things. Um, and on the other, uh, and on the other hand, uh, sort of, you know, the legal profession is extremely used to working in like really small increments, making calls, going to meetings. It's more of a manager's schedule. So here again, tension. Um, engineering is really a lot about binary thinking. Um, uh, legal is all about the, you know, the gray in between the black and the and the white, right? So, uh, you know, really spectrum thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, by nature, again, uh, legal and the company has a conservative role, whereas engineering has an innovative role. Um, so coming to agreement between these two sides requires, first of all, acknowledging that this tension is normal, right? Um, it's checks and balances. Uh, engineering, engineering is there to push things forward and legal is there to say, whoa, 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 you know, gently let's, let's, Let's be careful about this. Let's consider that. Let's make sure that we're, you know, not exposing the company to legal risk, right? Um, and, uh, you know, as an executive or someone like, you know, in an in, in open source programs office that's trying to um, make progress here, what you want to, to, know, to do is listen to both sides, right? And remind them that, like, both of their roles are needed to achieve uh, to achieve success and to make, you know, you know to achieve common business goals, right? Um, and so legal's role is to minimize risk, but it cannot do that at the expense of innovation, right? And on the other hand, engineering needs cannot be fulfilled at the expense of the company's survival. If the company, you know, if engineering is asking for things that don't make sense or that are putting the whole company in jeopardy, then that doesn't make sense, right? So, you want to find common grounds, and a good policy uh, will help find common ground and will actually help improve the quality of life and the stress level of both sides, right? Um, and of course, I mean, you know, I've, I've talked at like a plenty in other, other talks, but you want to align your open source activity with your business goals. Um, and you have to have everyone understand that. If you're a patent troll, uh, don't do open source, right? If your business relies on having a really strong open source presence, um, if you absolutely need to attract the best engineers, uh, do invest in open source and sort of like, uh, you know, tune down the, accept the increased risk on the legal side, basically. Right? And then lastly, accept that uh, an open source policy is something that was going to change um, with time and change with how your business is structured and how it evolves. So um, let's dig into the specific aspects of an open source policy. Um, 
an open source policy has basically two parts if you go you know at the high level one is using open source and the other one is contributing back to open source right and so if you look at using open source that that's a really well understood problem um we've been um you know we've been using open source as uh basically industries and you know for like uh close to well you know close to two decades at this point um and so uh you know the the, the main issues around around using open source from the outside is essentially one of compliance right and then one of like is the software that you're using compatible with your current and future business models it's the, the sort of like the two key aspects and as this is mostly a well understood problem and a problem in which there's a lot of uh, players that are you know offering really solid compliance solutions at this point i don't want to dwell on it too long um and i really want to focus instead on the contributing to open source aspects because i think um and i've talked about this again in the past like notably in in, in the um in, at the new york uh open source um uh, forum um in the fall um, um about the you know the benefits of contributing to open source versus using open source which now everyone is doing so there's you know there's no huge competitive advantage of using open source because everyone's doing it right? you, obviously you should but this is not going to give you an edge whereas building a strong open source contribution culture um uh, can actually give you an edge so if we look at contributing to open source the first thing that happens is obviously your engineers can contribute to open source at work and outside of work. Um, and uh, we should first talk about contributing outside of work because this is something that comes up very often. So, you know, one of the questions that comes up um, often is can employees contribute to open source on their own free time, right? Um, and you know, if you ask, uh, if you ask this question, so this is again, this is where I usually uh, do, uh, you know, ask the, the audience, um, uh, you know, yes, can you uh, contribute without asking for permission? Um, yes, but must ask for permission. So that sometimes means no, right? Um, I don't know, and no, right? So these are like the four uh, sort of questions, um, and if you know, there's that's been asked to the industry. Um, and, uh, you know, let's dig into the data that I have. So the question was, how does your employer's IP agreement policy affect your free time contributions to open source unrelated to your work? So if you look at the data that's from uh, the GitHub open source survey in 2017, um, you know, 47% said, yes, we can, I can absolutely uh, contribute to open source in my free time. Um, 12% had to ask, right? And 37% had no idea, just didn't know whether it was okay or not. Uh, so I find that really concerning, but if you uh, look at like where that sample data actually, where that data actually comes from, it gets really scary because um, that they, the respondents were sampled randomly um, from, Open source repositories on GitHub, right? So this is, you know, 40% of people that are actively using or contributing to open source software on GitHub in 2017, right? Did not know whether they were actually allowed to do so or not, right? So, you know, I find that really, really concerning. And so that's one reason why it's really important to have super good and super clear IP policy um, um, for engineers because it clarifies that problem, which basically becomes a liability for everyone. So why is there so much confusion about this? Well, the thing is, there's a number of reasons. First of all, it depends on the jurisdiction, right? Um, so um, in some countries or uh, you know, even in some states in some countries, um, it's not uncommon, for example, in the USA to have uh, the um, employer own the IP produced by an, uh, an employee 
24/7, regardless of the topic on which uh, that you know that IP is, right? Um, sometimes, like in for example, in California, you have extra criteria that apply, right? So you have, um, uh, for example, uh, whenever you're using company equipment, even if it's outside of work, right? Um, uh, the IP belongs to the employer. And when you think about the fact that you have, um, you know, a lot like the, the actual time that you spend building a developing development um, environment on a, a computer, the fact that every uh, engineer is now have you know now has a laptop that they bring at home, you can bet that a ton of open source that is actually not built, uh, you know, that is not related to work is actually built on company equipment. Um, and so, you know, that creates a whole, again, a whole bunch of liabilities uh, and misunderstandings and, and sometimes, you know, very painful outcomes for everybody, right? And so the problem of this confusion is that often prevents employees from contributing to open source if they're serious, um, or it actually creates a situation where uh, employees contribute to open source even though they're not really supposed to. Um, so, you know, one of the common solution for this um, is, well, employees have to just ask for permission uh, before being able to contribute on their, um, on their own time, right? So a lot of companies have a process for this, um, and it tends to be focused on employees releasing their own open source projects rather than contributing to existing projects. Um, and it also relies on having a set of pre-approved projects that you are working on. And this whole thing completely breaks down when you're talking about, for example, um, you know, languages with a super high number of dependencies like JavaScript and Node.js projects. Right? Because you basically, you know, if you have like uh, a thousand or, you know, 1500 uh, modules as dependencies, in, in a project that you're working on and you have to start fixing bugs in there. You're basically spending your time uh, writing emails to legal to get approval to work on like, you know, to do a one line change in a, in a random JavaScript module. So it's like, you know, that really doesn't work out very well. So there's a really interesting solution here that was built by GitHub that was designed by GitHub a number of years ago, which is called uh, BEPA, which is Balanced Employee IP Agreement which I encourage you to go have a look at. Um, and it's based on GitHub's own IP agreement. Um, and it basically only claims control of creations made for or relating to the company's business. So it's, it's really focused on um, what, you, you know, what, is, what an engineer is hired to be working on. And it lets basically engineers work on other things uh, without, you know, without claiming the IP there. So that basically makes everyone's life a lot easier if it's possible to implement in your company. It's a great option. Uh, so now that we've talked about contributing um, outside of work, let's get to contributing inside of work, right, at work. Um, and so here you have basically two big areas. One is when you're releasing a new software that you've built inside of the company, and the other one is when you're fixing or, uh, software uh, that you're relying on or that you're uh, you know, participating to as a company, but that is not, you don't own the whole IP originally. You're not releasing something. Let's look at releasing software first. Um, a couple of things that you can do here is um, to make it easier for sort of like streamline common cases where there's like very little legal risk. For example, um, Google has a smaller than 100 lines of code rule, or at least it did uh, a couple of years ago, it probably still does. Um, and the idea here is it is very common um, that you want to, um, for example, release a, sample, you know, a bit of code to demonstrate um, how, for example, an API that you've built um, right, so you have this API maybe that you're selling or maybe that you want, uh, to, you know, to uh, as an interface to your services for your clients or something like that. And, uh, you know, you're, you're the team that's in charge of documentation 
wants to write like a small app to showcase how to use that API or just even exa an example inline, right? Um, and they want to uh, release that under um, an, uh, an open source license so that uh, your clients are actually allowed to use it without having to go through like a, a complex process of obtaining, um, uh, you know, an agreement for them to do so, right? So Google has this great rule for this, which is to say, well, basically, if what, what you wrote is smaller than 100 lines of code, we're pretty confident it's not going to leak any essential IP of ours. And so you can just go ahead and open source it. You don't need to request special permission. So that's a really good sort of like way to basically handle a bunch of cases that would use up a lot of resources, of legal resources to approve, and where you're actually not protecting much by having, uh, you know, by having like a more stringent uh, requirements in it. The second thing that you want to do is you want to offer well-oiled and well-documented processes, checklists, templates, and everything to make it as easy as possible for um, your uh, engineers to release software, right? Uh, you need to find a, a number of really good resources um, on uh, the policies um, a repository of the Tudor group, which I encourage you to uh, go check out. Thirdly, as an open source programs office, what you want to do is offer help, right? Uh, just be available, uh, you know, make yourself available, make it clear how, you know, if you have office hours or that kind of stuff, so that engineers can actually reach out and ask questions. Um, and so I, I know that this, uh, sorry, I know that this last example, uh, this last point is probably going to be more difficult in the financial system than elsewhere. Uh, but one of the things that you, you, you that is great is if you can actually promote working in the open from the start, rather than releasing software once it's done. Um, if you build a community around software, like the earlier you release the software, um, the more ownership uh, contributors, external contributors, feel like they have, and the more they will get involved. So from an, uh, you know a building community perspective, it is much better. It's also a lot easier to release software when all you have is a readme file than when you actually have to go through, um, you know, commit history to make sure that you haven't uh, accidentally put some keys, you know, uh, like private keys in there. There are not like copyrighted images. There are not comments that uh, uh, shouldn't be, you know, that shouldn't be public. There's no like, um, you know, client data. There was, like the you know if if you've the whole process has been in the open, um, the, there is no sort of like risk of like this big um, you know jumping the cliff kind of moment moving from close to open. Um, and one interesting thing here is um, when a concept that's called readme driven development, um, which is a concept where basically you start by writing the readme um, so that the, you know the explainer of the software that you're going to be building uh, so that you clarify scope right legal can approve the readme um, and then engineering builds the software around the readme and if they want to really increase the scope that's when they go back to legal to have a conversation about it. Uh, lastly let's quickly look at patching um, so patching is, you know, by far the most common activity and the most important one in the uh, day of an engineer working um, on software relying on open source. Um, especially if you're working with, um, you know, more, more modern stacks uh, where everything is extremely modular. You're basically spending a lot of your time fixing small issues here and there in open source software that doesn't belong to you, you or your company. So the experience here must be as frictionless as possible for engineers. Because if every time you have to fix a one line and module, it takes like three days to get approval, it's basically impossible for them to do their work. And what happens is if they cannot do it at work, they will literally take it home and do it on their own time. And that has similar IP consequences for the company. Uh, uh, I, you know, legal starts to no longer be aware of what's going on. And, uh, you know, this is something that happens very commonly. I, I've 
I've actually had um, you know engineers come up to me at open source conferences, working in the banking industry, and telling me that they were taking um, you know they were doing work in the evening that they needed during the day because they you know the policies at their company uh, prevented them from doing that work during the day, and so they were just doing it on their own time. Right? So you know. You can look at it from the perspective of, well, it's great, you know, our employees are working at night uh, and we don't have to pay them. But the other way you can look at that is, well, that's kind of a really broken system. These employees are super interested to go work for someone else. Uh, I mean, they weren't like, you know, really keen to hear if there were like interesting options uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, and, um, you know, they're also, this is, this creates a huge risk from a legal perspective because legal no longer knows uh, who's involved with what project. Right? Um, so, yeah, the idea here um, is to, um, you know, make the process as easy as simple for engineers and trust that they will do the right, make the right decisions um, and, you know, ask and reach out for difficult cases. So obviously you want to balance this depending on like how, you know, um, your business, but make it as frictionless as possible, right? And then the last part is cash those decisions, right? If, if you've approved um, people contributing to Node, uh, well, just like do it once and then, you know, make it really easy, make, have a, you know, at least have a list of projects or GitHub repositories listed that uh, you allow engineers to contribute to. Um, so, you know, going back again, we talked about contribution, um, you know, open source contribution policies. Um, we didn't really dig into the using open source part because that's really essentially around compliance. It's a well understood problem. And we looked at basically uh, contributing to open source. S we split that up between outside of work and at work, and at work, we split up between releasing software and patching software. Um, and before I open up uh, for questions, I quickly want to talk about a uh, last thing that I've seen be extremely effective is actually once you have a strong policy, you can make it much better by turning it into an app or a service, right? Um, and how this works is basically, you know, the caching that we're talking about, um, you can you can cache uh, your answers. Um, you can automatically approve a number of requests that meet pre-established requirements and guidelines. For example, um, you know um, that's just an example, right? You could approve patching any MIT licensed open source project that's on GitHub. You could even say something like, well, you know, if it has a Git an MIT license or an Apache license. And it does not belong to uh, these three companies that we're currently uh, having a hard time with. Go ahead, do it. Right. Um, it can also automatically reject requests that don't meet your criteria at all. For example, again, you're building a cert, you're building software as a service. Uh, it's a GPL. You just don't touch it. Right. So you know, make that part of like this automate, automated, automated, um, you know system that you can use, right? Um, and this can actually remove a lot of the cases. And then basically any case that doesn't fit, uh, you know, pre-approved, cached, or um, that you automatically, that you know that you're gonna reject, you can manually handle and cache as you make decisions around those ma manual questions, right? Um, and you know, the benefit of that obviously is that the legal team gets to focus on the hard cases and not the common ones. Uh, what's really interesting is uh, Adobe actually, um, you know, I advised informally actually advised that the uh, Adobe's OSPO on this now about two years ago. Um, and when they implemented such a system, uh, what um, this gave them is, you know, open source reviews used, used to take 4.6 days um, and they were actually able to turn it into 4.6 hours, right? So every time there was a request before, it took it, it took basically a week and suddenly it was half a day. But the best part that's actually not on that slide and should be 
is that um, really quickly, I think the data was close to 95% of requests just basically were answered by the app itself. It was like pre-cache data, uh, or it was like licenses that were pre-approved, or was projects that were pre-approved, right? Um, so, you know, that was a huge boost for um, 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 you know, just um, productivity for engineering, and also for the legal department. And there's, you know, you actually get a lot more benefit from um, turning um, your policies into services like this because you can start collecting data, right? You can start understanding, well, you know, we know what projects do we open source, but do we actually know what projects we rely on and what projects we contribute to and how much? Like, who is asking to contribute to these projects, right? Uh, you can actually start to promote some of these projects. You can even start funding some of these projects if you really, like, are relying on them. Uh, you can also, in large companies, it's not uncommon for, um, you know, um, very different organizations to be relying on the same open source software and not even being aware of it. So, you, you know, as an OSPO that owns this information, you can suddenly start uh, connecting these engineers together and making them more effective at working together on these external projects. And that's it. That's all I have. So if you have questions, if you want to start a conversation around this, uh, now's a great time. And I'll interject briefly just to remind everyone that um, though FINOS typically does not record uh, its meetings except for the purpose of preparing minutes, uh, in this case, in order to make sure that this presentation is available to our broader community, we are uh, planning on making a recording available. So I just wanted to uh, be clear about that before uh, folks jump in with questions. If you'd like to jump, if you'd like to ask a question anonymously, feel free to post it to me privately in the chat and I'll ask it. And I have a question uh, about the developer's contribution um, inside uh, for the work inside of the company. Um, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, uh, do you have you seen some companies centralizing the contribution under a few employees? So instead of allowing all the engineers to contribute, they would do like a funnel or uh, to send the contributions to some senior engineers, and then they will review it and make a contribution on behalf of the company? So I have not seen this personally, uh, but I'm sure there are like companies that do uh, things in a, uh, you know, widely different, um, in, in widely different ways, right? Um, in general, the approach I recommend is you get real value out of contributing to open source if you're doing that as building a culture that goes towards this um, and where, um, you know, every engineer should feel like they're allowed and able to do this rather than having sort of like an elite team somewhere that is responsible for this. Um, what you can build is a team of, of, of people that have know-how, uh, that understand the open source culture, uh, that can sort of be mentoring and help out. But I would be careful of not making them gatekeepers because that tends to um, not really create the environment that is uh, conducive to innovation and building a strong culture. Okay, thank does that, you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Hey, this is Rob Underwood from Finos. I, I put a comment in the chat. I just wanted to underline, Toby, something you, a point you made that I think is super important about, especially United States employment agreements and the fact that they often um, are very um, expansive in terms of their, um, in terms of their claims around IP ownership. And um, if you, oftentimes, you know, the, the employee, Employment agreements will say, as you, you discussed, that anything that's done that's sort of in the general realm of the employer, uh, the employer's line of business, whether it's done on personal time, on personal equipment, becomes the property of the employer. I just wanted to contextualize. Um, I know we've gotten a lot of questions and some of other some of the other Finos programs and projects about the choice of the corporate contributor license agreement versus the uh, individual 
uh, contributor license agreement, it, it it's this uh, uh, often uh, this clause in employment agreements that often exists is a big reason why um, you know more often than not the corporate contributor license agreement, though sometimes a bit harder to execute, is the right choice because um, the because of these employment agreements. So. Um, don't want to turn this into a big discussion of the Finos contributor license agreements, but I know that that comes up and people sometimes look at the individual contributor license agreements as a perhaps an easier way to go. But in many cases, because of these IP ownership uh, clauses in employer agreements, employee employer employee agreements, um, more often than not, the contribute the corporate contributor license agreement is the right choice um, because oftentimes, whether you know it or not, the contributions you're you're making. Um, are in fact uh, uh, potential IP that are owned by your employer. And, and I would also say in, in, in cases, if you're a contractor, it could be the person that you're contracting with. So it's not just if you're an employee, but also if you're sort of on a full-time contract. So um, I just, just wanted to provide that context that's come up in the community a lot recently. So if it may feel like the contributor, the corporate contributor license agreement takes a little bit longer to execute, but that's why we often push for it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, it, it's interesting because, uh, and it also shows how, you know, lawyers tend to think in much more of a gray way around this because some, you know, different, different lawyers working for different companies, assessing the risk differently will have different perspectives on this. Uh, but, uh, yes, this explains why, uh, um, you're absolutely correct that this explains why corporate, um, uh, you know, uh, corporate CLAs are often, you know, protect the, the project more than individual ones. And I just say, and they actually it protect the individual too, right? So if you're an individual who works for a large bank and, you know, you were to execute an individual corp, uh, an individual CLA, um, and it turns out that what you were doing was in fact, uh, 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 IP that was owned by your employer, um, you might find yourself in a spot you don't want to be in. So you're better to have that Absolutely. coverage from your employer. Absolutely. Other questions? Um, Gilles here, just a comment uh, on CLAs. Um, it, uh, in the company I work for, the first uh, corporate CLA we had to sign took us three months to get approved by legal and various people who needed to go and sign it. Um, which means that the person who wanted to contribute was uh, uh, going to contribute in a contest and missed the deadline. The second one that we did uh, involving the same chain of command took a month and a half uh, because people still had the same questions. Um, I guess what I'm getting to is make sure you brief people and you work with the same team and they understand at the first time you try to do it, uh, what it means. and and for the first time, do it when you have time to do it. Yeah, I would just add on that, Gilles, that um, so that's a good example of, of where the sort of the scaling function of, of Finos can come into play. So, for example, we have a CCLA with Wipro now, right? And that covers contribution to any of the 108 projects within Finos. So, we are, one of the things that we do is, yes, that upfront getting the CCLA in place with uh, a member or a contributing organization within Finos can take some upfront time. But the good news is once it's in place, then we're good to go on on all of the Finos projects and then the scaling effects uh, kind of come into play, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. And the, 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 the Google rule, the, you know, if it's less than 100 code, lines of code, you can contribute without asking us, doesn't stop people from having to sign a CLA to, for the project they wish to contribute to. So it's a good rule, it makes things simple, but project you're contributing to is Kubernetes, you still have to get the corporate CLA or the individual CLA in place. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that rule was really targeted at um, more like the kind of code that you're releasing as part of like documentation or examples or answering something on Stack Overflow. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can publish as big as you want by, by blocks of 100 lines. <laughs> multiple answers i mean you know the, the, <laughs> i'm teasing you. No, but, no but you know i think like actually you know i think you're teasing but i think this is a really important aspect is if if you don't trust your engineers to be trying to do the right thing and if you suspect that they're going to try to 
you know, uh, run around uh, the block the, the the blocks that are in in, in the process. Um, it's either that you should hire different engineers, or that your process is basically so difficult to follow that people are running around it, right? So I, I think it, it's a I have really seen good that. example. Oh yeah, me too. Plenty of times, you know, processes that were horrible around people, it, and yeah. people that went around it, and and also people that were just like you know uh, not trustable in the company, right? Both of those are things that exist, um, but you know, again, if you're thinking about that from a risk perspective. Um, and, and balancing risk was, you know, velocity and innovation and in, in getting your engineering, in engineering teams to actually do the work that they want to do. You have to write, f find the right spot. Um, and for a company like Google, the right spot is to say, well, we trust people to release, you know, um, code the hundred, uh, less than 100 lines um, that uh, we don't believe there's going to be any risk and we trust them to do the right thing. Time for one more question. Anybody has one? Okay, in that case, I will thank Toby for a terrific presentation and uh, hope to see all of you back in two weeks on our next call. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Take care, take care of yourself. Thanks, Toby. Bye, Thanks, people. everybody. Thank Thanks. you.